Hello to you. Hello. So what's been happening in your week, uh, in your world this week, research-wise? Uh, it's been, been a bit exciting, actually. Um, oh, tell me. So I was talking last um, week about the draw people. The um, Now, just one sec. Grab my book. So draw, that's the... Yeah, um, so the departing, yeah. departing radically in academic writing. Okay. Alternative approaches to writing and methods in qualitative research. And so these people have a um, shut up and write session from 8 till 10 on weekday mornings. And so last week I decided to join one of them as somewhat nervously because you know like I didn't know anybody there and um but thought um and, and didn't know how not knowing how it run and I just sort of thought you know you get on there and write so I get on there and um one of the people there's only two other people on the call one of them is the editor of this book that I bought and the other mm -hmm. is one of the authors in the um, in the book and um, they were just amazing um, they it was well one made really welcome but um, they had um, you know talk about what you want to write about and then you wrote for half an hour and then came back and checked in on how you were going and that sort of thing. But they gave me such, um, I know, good ideas, um, you know, to, to feed from and, um, yeah, quotes and things, yeah. So it was just amazing. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And you said every morning they meet. They meet every morning, yeah, but... Um, like I got on on Friday and there was nobody on there. And so it's it's there each morning, whether anybody jumps on or not is up to their availability and need at the time. But, yeah, I dr jumped on for three mornings last week and um, had company for, for two of them. So, yeah. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And Anne-Marie, has it forced you to actually write or yes. are you trying to research? Yeah, it has. And one of the things that's really come out of it, because I'd sort of gone, like, I've got to write. I've done all this reading. I've got to do writing. And um, so I thought, like, I'll, I'll start on doing um, literature review. But then in doing that, and, like, I do remember from when I did my um, research many, many moons ago about doing an annotated bibliography first, but I hadn't even thought about um, doing that. And so I've gone back a step now and doing that rather because I was getting a bit lost in my... Um, trying to write the the literature review because I haven't done um yeah the I know summarizing in the background sort of thing yeah. of the ideas and things so yeah. and, and then I found out that um I did a bit more research and found out I can actually do that in EndNote um that you yeah put the um, your annotation in the research bit and then you press export and it'll um, export all your research notes that you've put in there um, into APA or whatever it is you choose to do it. So, yeah. 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 yeah um, look, we spoke about um, EndNote last week, but I've had a really busy week, so I haven't followed anything up. But today, this morning, uh, an email came from CDU and they're offering an EndNote training to HDR students. Yeah. So 
thinking that I'm going to book myself in into that, even though it's probably now too late for me because I'm mm-hmm. too far into it and I've, I've found my own processes. But I'm really interested for next lot of research that I do. I want to know how to use EndNote because you made it sound last week like it was just so very valuable. Mm. Out on that, I want to be able to use it. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's it's. Um, you know, I, I've I've always used it to some extent, um, but. Yeah, I've learned a lot more about it um, this time. Again, I did um, one of the EndNote things offered to HDR students um, through UQ and, um, yeah, sort of learned that it does, did a lot more than I was actually using it to, to do. Yeah. yeah, that's what you said last week. And how cool that HDR students get so many offers to mm. do these extra trainings, I, I greatly appreciate that because like you, I did not come straight from, you know, honours to doing a PhD, um, mm. <laughs> like been a few years in between. Yes, yes, two years. <laughs> a few years, a few glasses of champagne, um, many babies, many houses, <laughs> many countries. <laughs> oh, yeah. And... My uh, recent moves, so we had two major moves in four months, as you know, it's finally caught up with me and uh, I went to the cupboard to get something the other day and it wasn't there and, of course, I had to go, which house was that in? Uh, Oh, that's three houses ago and I could have just sold. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But it is what it is, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So this week I actually had a, I purchased a one-on-one session with um, uh, Claire Moran who did the QA training that I talked about last week. Yeah, yeah. So I bought her, this is her companion book that went with her training. So I purchased that and then I had a one-on-one session about structuring my um, uh, my research. Yeah, she was, yeah. She she was incredibly helpful. So different to supervision to PhD supervision. This was just about the way I am purposely collecting and theming uh, my research. So yeah. I'm doing top-down approach, I'm similar to what Brene Brown did. Um, she coded to her questions. But as I've been doing that, there's so many other themes that are emerging. So I had a good chat to Claire about that and uh, totally acceptable to put in all of those extra themes. But, my God, it is such a big job. Yeah, wow. yeah. And I, um, I naively thought that I would have had it finished by now. Um, I was a fool. I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But on the weekend, we went and purchased a fold-up table to put into my office because I've been. Um, we only arrived to Nullarbor with like our suitcases and a couple of boxes, right? So I don't have everything but I've been working between the kitchen table and the floor in my office like spreading all of my data out and you know with all of my colored pens and yeah the high tech yeah (laughs) (laughs) but how 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 are you going with everything else research wise yeah um I think um with the working with the those um draw people um yeah thinking about how to put things um creatively and and like using um metaphor and stuff in it without over doing it you know um you know whether you're i don't know viewing it as the landscape or stuff woven together or, or whatever but how to to um tie that that all in and the other thing that was really good with um because this this um elizabeth liz um, mckinlay she's just 
really she's apparently the chair of ethics at um southern cross uni um southern cross i think that's what she said um but anyway um but she's just really really approachable and i was just talking to her about you know the um i know stuff in literature that um i don't agree with you know that um yeah and while it may be true in some places i don't think it's actually true here and um anyway she was um um talking about um you know that you know you're allowed to have your voice and and, and that sort of thing and then introduced um me to yeah um um a quote by Virginia Woolf and that about, um, you know, going against the stream sort of thing and that sort of thing, but I'll do it anyway. And, you know, that it's hard, but I'll do it anyway. And, um, yeah, no, so, um, yeah, she, they're introducing me to some interesting people. Yeah, now that's, oh, you knew who Virginia Woolf though was, didn't you? I knew who she was, but I'd never read anything of hers. Yeah. But I love Virginia Woolf because she's a feminist, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also her values sit tightly with social work values, with um, challenging the status quo and with um, ensuring social justice. Like I really liked her ideas and the way she put it into narrative. Uh, and to popular literature of the time. Like, it was great. Yeah. 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 I, I read a book called Who's Scared of Virginia Woolf? Uh, and it, it was it was really fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, it was life-changing for me because I've been scared of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I did, so when I, back when I did my, uni studies I um you know I, I got mostly HDs for my subjects and you know but I did feminism as one of my subjects and I um only got a credit for it and I was very um I know disheartened by it and felt that my view wasn't listened to in amongst their, you know, it was a feminist subject. But at that particular time and with my experience, it didn't align with, um, I don't know, what they were saying or that they were saying it was universal sort of thing. And I was going, yeah, well, no, it's not. And so, um, yeah, I didn't do very well at that subject. But my views um, with experience have changed over time too. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, positionality, but the, the lens that we choose to look through because of everything that we've been through as human beings and as social workers absolutely changes the way we approach research. So I'm a, um, like, you know, I'm feminist and staunch feminist. And because of my experiences, I'm a wave two feminist. Uh, so feminism came in waves and each wave fought for something different. But we, we appear to have a situation where some waves don't talk to each other. They forget that. Waves one and two had to really fight for a foundation so that these ongoing waves can then fight for something different. Yeah. Um, I find it really distressing um, to hear that your wave or your positionality wasn't recognised. And I wonder if it was because you didn't position yourself well enough um, uh, was it being marked by a, a critical feminist 
uh, who wanted a deeper universal argument from you, whereas you were coming from a position. Of yeah. Going, but, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. And I think that's really good for both of us to think about as we're positioning ourselves in this research because, look, I am not a Trump supporter in any way, but if there was a Trump supporter sitting beside me, we would both see my theorists completely differently. Yeah, yeah. We would read the same text, but we'd both take different things out of it. Well, in fact, given that Grumshi, one of my... Um, theorist is a Marxist, a Trump supporter probably wouldn't even pick up the book. <laughs> but if they, <laughs> if they did, they would maybe dismiss it because their lens is different to my lens and their experience is different to my experience. Same with the incel movement. Um, do you know what incel stands? It's involuntary celebrate. So it's a lot of those men who have been so hurt by women um, and can't have a relationship that they yeah. have a particular view of the world and feminists are shit. You know, feminists are the cause of all of the problems in the world. Uh, you know, we need to have this male-centric control because men are better than women, uh, yeah. which makes me sick. But through the research I did through the data collection, I had to listen to some stuff that I didn't believe in. But, yeah. of course... What about me? It's about collecting data and what do other people believe in? What do they? What yeah. do they? Yeah, and you will remember because you were one of my participants. What else do people read? Some people do read Jordan Peterson. Some people do read Andrew Tate. I have no idea why, <laughs> but it's about their free will as well and their choice. And they're resisting something, just like I read to resist. They do too. So they read to resist those hairy-legged lesbian feminist bitches um, <laughs> because that's the lens that they see the world through. So, yeah, interesting. Yeah, my, Most of my um, extra reading comes from my um, friend Jeanette and she, um, she reads books and if she thinks I like them, she hands them on to me. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you said that. And do you always like them or not? Generally, there's a few that I haven't, but not many. She's pretty. She pretty knows what what I like. But yes, yeah, that that way she's got more time than me. She can sort through the. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she listens uh, to a lot of um, radio national and um, hears people speak about their books and that because most of them are um yes stories of people's lives and that sort of thing yeah so um yeah has she read um or have you received yet hang on i'm just going to grab it uh, i loved it where is it where is it the wartime book club no Oh, brilliant. The Wartime Book Club by Kate Thompson. Yeah. Now, we're going to do this at Online Book Club in March. Okay. So I'm doing Where the Crawdads Sing for yeah. January. Then Cardine yeah. is doing the um, Owl and the Pussycat for February. And then I'll do this one in March, the Wartime Book Club. And I'm also making reference to this in uh, my thesis. Yeah. Even though it's it's written as um, a narrative, it's written as fiction, it's actually based on non-fiction. It's based on fact. So I love her style. Yeah. yeah. But well worth it. I've been listening to um, what's it? Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, Sorry, say that again. Braiding Sweetgrass. It's okay. um, American Indian, um, and it, it talks about um, a lot about the ecology of the place and the balance and um, responsibility and reciprocity and 
those sorts of things that um and then materialism and how that doesn't all all fit together that you know we've all got we've all got our gifts and we're supposed to actually use those we've got a responsibility to use those gifts in a way that benefits um um not just people but the environment and um that sort of thing because we're we're part of the whole system you know and it's interesting the way she puts it rather than it just being and it fits with uh you know a lot of the um aboriginal um ways of thinking too but it's got some um you know quite um quite interesting ways the way yeah the connections and everything it's it's really it's quite good it's very slow um like listening to it um it's like this calming sort of thing going on and <laughs> but yeah it's it is good though so it's on audible yeah yeah Okay, interesting. And also interesting that once again our lives have paralleled because this this week I went to a um, um, a cultural training morning uh, put on by Paul's work and I requested to go. Like even though I've been to thousands of cultural trainings over my years working in Indigenous communities, this community is completely different. It's different, that's right, yeah. This is every community. So I asked to go along. It was the best one I have ever been to. It was evidence-based. They used real stories and um, she puts, uh, the presenter puts practical examples behind everything that she said. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Um, and, of course, we had um, Witiana from Yothu Yindi was in the room as well. Um, yeah, so he like he was throwing in examples as well. Um, um, Witiana is one of the directors of the company that Paul works for. Oh, oh so, okay. Yeah, um, so there's a fair bit of ongoing contact there, but it was just excellent uh, explaining um, the sun's rays, the way the spears are carried. Uh, anyway, long story short, uh, was very, very good and I gave excellent feedback. Um, but there is, on Netflix at the moment, there is a movie called High Ground and it's um, um, uh, Witiana is the old, uh, the grandfather in there. Yeah. Uh, and the young, are you aware of the Indigenous model? She's dropped dead gorgeous. She's tall and skinny and just beautiful. She was a Miss World entrant. Yeah, I have. Um, I've seen, I don't actually know, but I have seen. Okay, her, so yeah. Magnolia, It's Magnolia is one of her names. It's not her Indigenous name, but she goes by Magnolia. Probably yeah. not easy for white people to say but she's also from here so she's in the movie uh, which is why we watched it because it's got local uh, actors you know people that we know um, yeah. but also the story um, of what happened like very interesting so I thoroughly recommend it but, but warning it's sad yeah okay yeah, like the massacres that happened yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's sad, but it was good. Anyway, shall we write for half an hour today? Yeah, that sounds good. Are you okay with half an hour or do you want to go the hour? Yeah, no, half an hour sounds good. Okay, yeah. wonderful. I'm doing intermittent fasting. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to now fit everything around when I can eat. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. All right, so let's well, put this on silent and let's write, all right? Yes. I'm just going to go and get a drink of water, then I shall be right yeah. into it. Okay, and then I'll give you a warning at um, or a, yeah, at about 29 minutes past. Um, okay. Or 29 minutes into it, I'll just let you know we've got a minute to finish. All right, see okay. you soon. Okay.
One minute, Anne Marie. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just going to shut the recording off then. See you later. See you next week. Every Monday morning, 9 a.m. Northern Territory time. So we do half an hour of discussing what our research is, and it's our social work research. So this is a group that's open to social workers. Doesn't matter what university you're from. Um, or if you're employed to do research or if you're in HDR research. But we get together to discuss social work research concepts, what we're doing, and then we silently write for half an hour. So join us next week. I look forward to seeing you.